Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar. We will get started in just a few minutes. If you would like to um, share in the chat where you are calling in from and what brought you to the webinar today, what's your connection? Um, we'll get started just in a few minutes. All right, thanks everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, I wanna welcome you to the first installment of the 2022 Rural Grocery Succession Planning Monthly Webinar Series. My name is Ryle Carver and I'm the program leader for the Rural Grocery Initiative. I see we have people uh, joining and sharing their names and introductions. We love to see that, so keep those coming. Please be sure that when you type into the chat, you are sharing with everyone rather than just the hosts and panelists so we can all see who is in our virtual room here. So um, just a quick introduction, the Rural Grocery Initiative is a unit within K-State Research and Extension. So we work across the state and the country to support rural grocery stores and to enhance uh, community vitality and improve access to healthy foods. We are so glad you're joining us today. Uh, the topic of rural grocery transition planning is really one that's near and dear to us as we've seen grocery stores close and communities fade as a result. Um, but uh, there's, there's much work to be done and we've learned over the years that business transition planning can be a key piece to uh, keeping rural communities vibrant and grocery stores vibrant. So it's a complex process, but this monthly webinar series aims to demystify that process, connect you with key resources and content experts, and hopefully support some smooth uh, rural grocery ownership transitions. So today um, we'll provide an overview of the succession planning process, including key benchmarks and milestones along that journey. We'll hear directly from a grocer who transitioned into a business and is already uh, planning ahead for a future transition. We are pleased to have Carl Klein, Regional Director of the Washburn University Small Business Development Center, and Regina Lance, owner and general manager of the Mildred Store in Mildred, Kansas, uh, with us today to share their perspectives on this important topic. Before we get too far into the uh, webinar, we would like to acknowledge our sponsor, the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation for making this webinar series possible. And of course, we have a few housekeeping items to cover. Uh, first, we wanna share that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website under uh, the, the events tab on ruralgrocery.org. We also ha have set aside time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. So if you have any questions for the presenters, please share those in the Q&A box that you should find on your Zoom control panel. If you have additional introductions or comments on the content um, that you wanna share with other webinar participants, feel free to use the chat box. So with that, we will go ahead and get started. And to do that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Erica Blair, who's gonna kick things off. All right, thank you, Ryle. And hello, everybody. It's great to see so many people from across the country joining us today. Um, I wanted to start out just by laying out the foundation for why rural grocery stores are so important. And I'm sure this is not going to be a surprise to any of you joining today, that's probably why you're here. So we can go to the next slide. So our office at the Rural Grocery Initiative considers rural grocery stores to be 
anchor businesses because they provide these three crucial services for their communities. So they provide economic development opportunities, um, public health benefits, and they serve as community gathering spaces as well. Next slide. So when it comes to economic development, rural grocery stores are an important source of jobs. I think this photo on this slide of Hired Man's Grocery in Conway Springs really helps to illustrate that point. There are over 20 people on this in this picture. Um, locally owned stores also help to recirculate local dollars and they generate state and local tax dollars as well. And finally, um, grocery stores, if we want to go back one back to the economic development slide. They also help to prop up other local businesses because if people don't have to travel out of town to get groceries, they're more likely to stay in town for their other shopping needs as well. Next slide. So grocery stores provide economic, uh, public health benefits as well. There are numerous studies showing the connection between food access and health outcomes. Grocery stores provide a critical source of healthy, nutritious food, and they offer these foods at lower cost than their convenience store counterparts. Next slide. And finally, grocery stores are anchors of community life. They help to form the, their community identity. They are places where people can build social capital. Many grocery stores have cafes or delis where people can gather and connect with each other. Um, this slide shows a sneak peek of the Mildred store, which we're going to hear about later in this webinar. Um, and it's just a great example of how grocery stores are so much more than just simply a place to buy food. Next slide. So it's really no wonder that so many people are invested in making sure their local rural grocery store continues to thrive well into the future. Um, we have seen that city leaders, economic developers, other community members are very concerned about this issue because they know that having a grocery store in town is crucial to make sure that their entire community prospers and that their residents have a good quality of life. Next slide. So that leads us into why we're focusing on succession planning. So in other words, once the grocery store owner is ready to move on, who is going to take over the business? And when a succession plan hasn't been developed, it's more likely that the store will close. And that's not good for the business owner financially. It's also not good for the community that they serve. So, the Rural Grocery Initiative conducted a survey in 2021, and we found that this topic is really, it really needs some more attention. So the average rural grocer in Kansas is 57 years old, so that's getting closer to retirement age. Almost 40% of respondents said that they plan to transition out of their store in the next five to 10 years, but over 80% did not have a transition plan for the future ownership of their grocery store. And this is not just an issue in Kansas. This is happening across the nation as well. These trends are happening everywhere, really. Um, so that just tells us that this is a topic we need to be focusing on. Um, because as we're going to hear in just a moment, it's, it's really important to start planning early for a business transition. Next slide. So some of you today may remember that in 2021, we held a series of webinars on business transition planning. It was called Keeping Groceries Alive. And so I wanted to do just a quick poll today to see where people are at. I'm just curious to see who attended those webinars. So we're gonna do a quick poll if you wanna launch the poll. Um, let us know if you attended most or all of the webinars in the series, if you attended a few of the webinars in the series, if you heard about it but you didn't attend any, or if this is your first time ever hearing about that webinar series. We're just curious to hear. Um, while you answer that poll, 
um, just a little bit more about keeping groceries alive. It was a really good introduction, a good foundation for um, business transition planning, but there, there's still so much more to cover. Um, and that's why throughout 2022, we're hosting this webinar series where we're going to be diving even deeper into succession plan planning topics. Um, so let's go ahead and show the results. So it looks like for the majority of you today, this is your first time hearing about that webinar series. Um, so that's great. Uh, this is this webinar today, this kickoff webinar is going to give you some really good background information on business transition planning. Um, and if you wanna go back and watch those Keeping Groceries Alive webinars, um, the recordings are available at ruralgrocery.org. Let's go to the next slide. So now without any further ado, we are very excited to be joined by Carl Klein, who has a lot of experience on this topic. Um, Carl is the regional director of the Washburn University, Kansas SBDC. He's also a certified exit planning advisor and a certified valuation analyst. So Carl, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Eric. I appreciate that introduction. And it's great to be here to talk to you today about succession planning from my view. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I think one of the key questions that always gets asked is what is success, succession planning? And very similar to business planning, um, it's laying out a map of how you're gonna exit or how you're gonna succeed your business. I took a special interest in this when I came to the SBDC after uh, selling a couple businesses and buying one. I fit that 81% category. I had no succession plan when I first started business and not till about 10 years in did I even think about the succession process and selling the business and transitioning to someone else. In my own personal case in both businesses, my kids worked in the business, they wanted nothing to do with it. So I learned early on that the transition that was gonna take place was gonna to have to be a sale to another individual. And I was leaving the business with no family members involved. So that was my process. And I was very fortunate. Um, I had two successful transitions. And after those, I realized just how lucky I was to have done some things right. And you can also learn from some of my mistakes. We talk about the components of a succession plan. This is by no means comprehensive. But first off is understanding the ownership structure of the business. And it is, is it the best ownership for that transition? Uh, you might be a sole proprietorship, you might be a corporation if you've been in business a long time, uh, you might be an S-Corp. What is the best entity or the best ownership for that transition? It all depends on how you transition, family members, tax situations. The best way to figure that out is through the process of an accountant or a CPA to help you understand the tax ramifications and the process that can be involved with the succession and how that entity can help you transition in different ways in tax savings. The, the next key indicator is timing. And when you look at timing, the timeline really varies. I think for rule-based business in general, it's a little longer because you have a lesser pool to pull from for people purchasing the business. It also varies with uh, what I talked about earlier. If it's going to be a family transition, if it's going to be an outright sale transition, carry back, internal sale, all of those have bearing on that. Knowing what kind of deal structure is going to take place is very important. What I mean by deal structure is as the seller, when you do sell the business, do you have any intent of carrying back any of the debt? or do you just want to cash and get out kind of a deal structure? Those are all relevant to the conversation. And then of course, preparation and timeline. Next slide, please. So when we talk, start talking about that timeline, it, it varies greatly, but before you enter the timeline, you've really got to make a personal assessment about where you are in the whole process. So the first step is determining your personal goals and desires once you sell the business. Um, how old are you? I think we saw the average age in there, about 57. 
if you sell at 57, you may not retire right away. You might want to do something else. What is that? And how much income is that going to provide you? And what does that look like? That is something to think about early on. Uh, your financial needs and responsibilities. Um, great, great place to look at what do I need to retire on? How, how much? What is my lifestyle going to be after retirement? Am I going to travel the world? Or am I going to stay at home and play with the grandkids and play golf and go fishing? Those entertain different economic needs. And you really need to know those when you start the transition process so you can make some determinations on that timeline, what you're going to do post-retirement, when you're going to sell. It all has a bearing. And then the business legacy and performance. Um, this is a hard one sometimes to wrap your head around. But throughout the years, I've had owners come in that had valuable businesses and the sale price was not as important to them as the person that they were selling it to. Um, in one case, a person wasn't going to sell to somebody with a higher offer. They were selling to somebody with a lower offer because they thought they brought more integrity to the business and more of a future legacy for the original owner. So all important aspects. Next slide, please. So how do you, how do you, what is that timeline? What is that timeline? Well, I'm going to go here with a minimum of 10 years uh, for a good successful exit strategy. Sure, you can start before that. I think in the rural grocery business, a minimum of six years and an absolute bare minimum of three years. And, and I say that subjectively, that's not written in stone anywhere. That's just my own assessment after working with some grocery stores and rural businesses. So that first step in the process, we, we always want a timeline. We want to know what do we do? How do we do it? I think meet with a financial planner or maybe a certified financial planner, if you can find one, to help you calculate those financial needs after the sale. And through that, you're going to need to know when you start a value, at least a cursory value of your business. You don't need to go out and pay a valuation analyst $10,000 to value your business. You, if you have the opportunity to reach out with somebody in a small business development center, we can get uh, a rule of thumb value for your business uh, to some extent to at least get a starting point or something that you can put a dart on or a pin in to get started. And I'll tell you a little bit more about valuation later. And I know that they have a valuation webinar coming up. I would highly encourage you to attend that because every valuation scenario in small business is different. I'm a certified exit planning advisor and I'm also a certified valuation analyst. So we do do some business valuations. And most of those that I do are just from a purview of what does it look like in a best case scenario. So some of the key factors to consider in setting these goals and milestones are your age, uh, the health of the business, is the business growing, is it declining, you know, is, is it moving along very steady? Because when you value that business, you want to look to the future, but you also want to look historically. And, and if it's on a downward trend, that is not the time to sell. The best time to sell, obviously, would be on an upward trend or an increase in sales revenue. Some other risk factors, personal health. Um, what, what is your health? If you're 57 and super healthy, maybe you've got 10 more years to plan that exit. Um, what, what's the family situation look like? I've seen too many instances over the years where I'm going to have a family member take over this business. So I'm not really worried about transition. But when it gets down to the final year, the family member doesn't want the business. Then it turns into, uh-oh, are we going to need to have a fire sale? Are we going to need to have an asset sale? What does this transition look like? Man, I wish I would have started planning earlier. So knowing the family, knowing that if you have somebody that wants to buy the business, if there's truly that commitment there and getting that process started. And then of course, community engagement. Uh, I heard Erica talk about that earlier. And I think that's just one of the biggest unknown factors in rural grocery sales is what is the community buy-in? What is the community to support the, the business? If you have high levels of community engagement, high levels of community support, I think, and as a general rule, you're going to have a more valuable business 
because of the people that are going to help you promote the sale of the business when it comes time, finding a buyer, and, and just supporting the overall transition. Next slide, please. So goals and milestone. Uh, determining that value, like I said, important. If you get a chance to attend that webinar, that would be fantastic. I think you'll learn a lot. Setting a desired sales price and the limits of owner carryback. Um, that goes into the financial planning for the exit when you determine that I'm going to sell this business for $500,000 and I'm not carrying it back any. You're going to have a little bit more difficulty finding a buyer than if you're going to sell it for $250,000 and you're going to carry back $250,000. But what does that mean to you from a risk level? That definitely puts you at more risk. So understanding the limits of where you want to go with there with the transaction is important. What are your options if a sale does not occur? Um, as unfortunately we talked about, not all businesses transition. And if that doesn't occur, what is the asset value? What's the fire sale? What's the asset closeout value of your business? What does that look like for retirement or succession? This is a really interesting point when it's determining how you will market the sale of the business. I think as a general rule, um, nobody wants anybody to know that their business is for sale, but they want to sell it for the maximum amount of money. So figuring out who's going to help you sell this and market this is a large part of the succession planning process. The family transition, uh, if you're going to do that, a family member may make a great employee, but when it comes to the leader as aspect of a small business, there's a skill set that needs to be acquired. Uh, when you become the leader, the boss, uh, you've got some friendships there. There, there. There's some obstacles that need to be overcome with learning how to lead if you're taking over that business, especially if it's a family transition and it's 100% owner carryback where the family transition is going to be the depending factor on retirement income. That really needs to be worked out and understood. And of course, uh, tax implications. What are tax implications of the different sales scenarios? In a family transition, it's gonna start early. You might have some gifting options there based on the entity. Uh, next slide, please. So your list of uh, team members, typically accountants, CPAs, those are, I think, the critical ones, along with a financial planner, big factors. Enhancing the value of your business, buying the right assets, putting them at the right place at the right time are critical. And then having a, a growth plan and a timeline written down that you can actually populate would be another uh, key, key check sheet to have for the transition of your business. Next slide. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little about the do's and don'ts of business transition as I wrap this up. Um, I come from a family of business transitions. The business on your left was started by my grandfather in 1942, ran for 70 years, and is now Nord's Baker in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, didn't survive to the third transition. I could have been the third transitional owner, but that did not take place. A lot of reasons for that. Won't go into it, but let's go to the next slide. Okay. So what does a good business transition look like? Well, a lot of the things that I've talked about factor into that. And, and one of the biggest is find somebody that will buy your business that's credit worthy, uh, that has ownership, business experience, and most of all, grit and determination. I spent a couple of years as a district sales manager traveling Kansas and Colorado and covered about 24 stores and 24 stores. And at any one time we had at least two stores for sale or transitioning. So I transitioned about four stores in uh, that two years. And that grit and determination piece is hard to measure, but I did find one instance where the, the buyer only held onto the store for about six months. And I found the, the, the store keys on the front door one morning, they just gave up. So grit and determination is a big factor. So, so think about that when you're looking at a, at a buyer. And credit worthiness is the ability to, to, to service the debt and get the loan. So when you're looking at a buyer, you really want to know that they have the capacity to purchase your business. You want to transfer your business as an ongoing concern. You'll hear, hear that a lot in the valuation community. That means a business gets transferred as a profitable business that's producing revenue and putting some money back aside or in the bank for future use. Um, 
a retirement sale that is on the seller's terms. What does the seller's terms look like? That means knowing what you need for retirement, you're going in and getting the cash amount up front that you need. And if you have carry back terms, those carry back terms fit exactly uh, what your risk factors will absorb. A new owner is there and able to operate and maintain the business. Um, that means that again, they have the experience and the skill set. You want to make sure that you know that up front. And then, of course, no closes, uh, no surprises at the closing time or after the transaction. Next slide, please. So I'm, I'm running out of time here, and I'll, I'll go through these pretty quickly. But a so so business transaction that really doesn't work out is typically a longer timeline. When you get past retirement, you might run into some health issues and you have a fire sale, higher owner carry back than you anticipated. 70-30 uh, is the rule of thumb there, what's kind of what might be the norm. Um, say you get into a 50-50 situation, you've really got a lot more risk there than a 70-30 or a 100% cash out buy. Fewer proceeds in the bank post-transaction than anticipated. This is really understanding the tax ramifications of selling your business and how those assets and at what value they get transferred. You really need an accountant to help you with that. When somebody waits too long to sell their business and they run into health and disability issues, those are factors. And new ownership can't service the debt load. So maybe the business sold for too much. And if you got a high level of carry back, you can run into some real problems. If you look at this from the buyer's point of view, the buyer wants a business that they can purchase, that they look at, that they're going to pay a reasonable amount for, that it's going to provide them a level of income. They're going to be able to pay the principal and interest on that debt that they've paid you over that period of time. And whether it be five years, seven years, when that's all said and done, they're still going to have a valuable asset there to move forward with. And lastly, uh, the difficulty in the sale of a highly owner dependent business. This sometimes doesn't get or factor into the calculation. You have some businesses where nobody likes the owner and everybody looks forward to a new transition and people come in and that's great. But on the flip side of that, you have a highly owner dependent business where the owner has great relationships with all of his customers and everybody in the community. If you don't factor that into the understanding of how this is gonna affect the transition, you could be setting yourself up for failure. So that's it for me. Uh, I appreciate your time today. I think my email is posted here somewhere. If anybody else has questions, reach out to me. I am very glad to help you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Carl. That was um, a great overview of succession planning. And I know that we went through a lot in just 15 minutes. So if you're in the audience and you're like, wow, that I need more information, you should stick with us <laughs> throughout 2022 because we're going to go into so much more detail throughout this series. Um, if you have questions for Carl, please remember to post them in the Q&A box and we'll have time at the end to get to those questions. So now we are very excited to have a real world example for you all today so that you can see how this process looks for a grocer and we can see what Regina is thinking about, uh, how she's thinking about this process. So Regina Lance, um, is, an, is the owner and general manager of the Mildred store in Mildred, Kansas. We can go to the next slide. Just a quick intro of Regina. Regina has a master's degree in education and has been in education for over 20 years. She and her husband, Lauren, have had several business ventures over the years, but with the purchase of the Mildred store, Seven years ago, the couple found a niche in a town of less than 25 people. Finding unique ways to attract customers has become one of Regina's strengths and has helped the business grow. So Regina, thank you for being here today. I'm gonna to turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Um, the Mildred store is definitely a unique place. And if you'll go to the next slide, please, we'll take a look at some of the statistics the 2020 population 
Um, the census says 23. Actually, if you count, there's less than 17 usually. Um, the town was actually established in 1912. And only two of the original buildings from the town remain. And one of them is the store and the other is the church. We do have ruins of the cement plant, which um, brought nearly 3,000 people to the town in the highlight of the day, which was um, from about 1912 to the late 20s when the depression hit. Next slide, please. Um, this store has three parts to it. There's the main grocery store that used to be a hardware store. And then we have a room next to it that we consider part of our, our music room per se. And that was a garage. And then there's a larger portion in the back that was a feed store. Um, the previous owners were the Brown family. It started with Scott Brown. And then honestly, the next owners that I grew up around were Charlie Brown and his wife, Lucille. Um, not, not the cartoon characters, but the real life people. Um, Charlie had gone to the war and when he came back, they established a grocery store in 1945 with him and his wife and his brother. And it remained in the Brown family for 99 years. Um, the store began selling out in 2014. And this was our only little local grocery store. Um, from my house to the nearest Walmart, it's gonna take you a good 30 minutes. So the town had used this store for years and as the town dwindled, the community still relied on it. And so um, my husband and I were coming through one day and it was sporadic when the store was open and we saw people here. So we stopped in and asked what was going on and they were gonna be selling it out. And so we kind of inquired, but they didn't know exactly what they were gonna do. And um, it was in the hands of a grandson and it wasn't being um, maintained. He had health issues, so it wasn't open on regular hours and wasn't consistent. So we had had another business venture and we had just recently exited that. And so we were sitting at home one evening and I needed an egg to bake a cake. And several people have heard this story before, but it's like, I don't want to drive 30 minutes to go get one egg. Um, so I looked at my husband and he looked at me and we both kind of came up with, well, what do you think about buying the store? And it kind of happened right then and there. And we made, we looked at some figures from the past and made an offer to the people and actually bought the store outright with no um, borrowed money or anything. So that gave us a, a good start. And we had absolutely no grocery store experience of any kind. The inventory here was very outdated and there was very little left on the shelves because they had been um, selling out every Saturday for a couple months. Next slide, please. So growing up around here, I knew a lot of the things that had happened in this store as a child and as, a, as an adult. And so one of the things that this place was known for was its sandwiches. Um, we have a good deli with um, sandwiches. And I can remember as a kid coming over here and getting sandwiches and they were like $1.75 a piece. And they were a huge sandwich. And so one of the things that we wanted to put right back in was the sandwiches. And so that was one of the first things that we did. Another thing that was a tradition around here was this was the place everybody came to. Um, years ago, there was a pot-bellied stove and everybody gathered around the pot-bellied stove and, and talked and you know had their co coffee and you know the guys carried on their conversations about how they were gonna solve all the farming issues and all of that. Um, Lucille was very good about when little kids came to the store, everybody got candy when they left she'd throw in hands full of candy. Um, at Christmas time, you could guarantee that there was gonna be the old fashioned Christmas candy, peanut clusters, peanut brittle, cherry mash, all of those things. And once a year at Christmas time, Santa would come and Santa gave a little bag of goodies to all of the kids and it was a big community potluck get together. And so, with those traditions in mind, we wanted to keep those traditions because that's what the community knew. And so um, 
we brought each one of them back a little bit at a time. Um, the Christmas party, our first year having it, my husband was in the back and he had set up the back room with tables and chairs. And I said, what are you doing? And he's like, I, I'm done setting up tables and chairs. I got enough. There's probably here enough for, you know, 30, 40 people. And I'm like, you don't have enough. He's like, well, we'll wait and see. Our first Christmas party, we had 120 people. The next year, we maxed the building out at 250. So it, it brought back a lot of the community together and, and that's a big piece of what keeps us going. Next slide, please. Some of the new traditions that we've started. Um, my husband really likes to play music. So, and prior to that, um, Michael, who was the grandson of Charlie and Lucille, he would have kind of jam sessions sitting around the table in here and some of the people who played music would come and my husband had participated in those. So we just started a monthly music night and our monthly music night has grown so much. We started in the first room and got to 60 people and decided we need to do something different. So when the weather was nice, we moved it outside. Then we couldn't always be outside. So we cleaned out the back room that had a hundred years of accumulation of stuff. And now we can host music night and we normally run 150 to 200 people. Um, car shows, we have a yearly car show, a spring fling, which can be anything from crafts to garage sales, a fall festival, which is always crafts and fall items and have pu free pumpkins for the kids. Um, a Christmas bazaar. This year we varied, we tended to do something different because somebody else in the community, a community close to us did a Christmas bazaar, which ours was like, you know, crafts and different items that you can buy for last minute Christmas gifts. So I tried to think outside the box, what can I do since they're doing that right up the road? So we did an open house and a taste testing of a lot of our featured products that a lot of people don't really didn't weren't aware that we had that was one of the biggest and best things that we've had um, we had a tremendous response i made charcuterie boards to show people what we could do and what we had and they tasted some of the dips and various things that we had and it was a huge success so you know don't always um just say well somebody else is doing that i can't do it think outside the box and come up with something new and it may be your greatest invention yet. Next slide, please. So here's an example of some of our events. Um, at the fall festival, I bring in lots of um, mums and different decor for people to buy to take home to their, um, you know, their yards. Plus we use it for um, decoration. Um, we have a young local boy who has a popcorn business and he comes. I've had magicians, um, the picture in the in there with the magician and the little girl on the stage. He's a he has performed in Las Vegas and was a good friend of ours, so he came. Um, we also have had visits from Mrs. Kansas and Miss Kansas and things like that at the different festivals. And I usually use our local paper to help me advertise that as well as social media. And so at the bottom, you can just see some of the different designs that we've done. Next slide, please. Um, my husband and I have gone through um, some John Schallert training, and I don't know if you're aware of him, but he helps you focus on getting your business to become a destination, a place somebody wants to go. So you have to find out what is unique about your business and about yourself. And everybody has it. You just have to really, really look and see how how you can set yourself aside from everyone else. Um, we're the only 100 year old grocery store with a dance hall in the back. Um, and we're the home of the Belt Buster sandwich. So each thing that you add makes you more individualized. Um, we gained a signature item because of one gentleman's hunger. And we have a Belt Buster sandwich, which includes a pound of meat and cheese total. And um, it's a big one. And, people come in and they can actually eat it in one setting. So, but by going through this um, training, we learned how to set ourselves aside and set us, as, set us up as unique. 
And we also had used the Charlie Brown logo and various things like that for a long time. And we were getting out there far enough that we thought we needed to rebrand. And so we worked with a marketing expert and he came up with the, the items that you see on the screen. The lower left is our business card, front and back. And then we have posters that represent an old time poster um, that people take with them and distribute. And we're always hearing, oh, I saw your poster here or there. And so it brings and brings new people in all the time because they read a little bit about it and get interested and intrigued. So they want to come. Next slide, please. So some of our future plans are, um, first of all, I should preface that with 90% of the customers who come through my door are men, um, farmers in general. So how do I attract the women in the area? So we're gonna try some women's days and women's afternoons to bring more women in. When the pandemic hit, it was really frustrating to me to see on Facebook and social media that some of the local gals in the neighborhood are like, oh, I can't find this anywhere, Amazon's out. I can't get it on, um, can't get it through Sam's or anything like that. And I'm like, it's right here at the store. So come on out. So we need to find ways to increase the woman foot traffic here. Um, also we have with our music nights, we get a lot of families in and younger families with kids. So we're looking at doing some family game nights, maybe movie nights um, and some cornhole tournaments. We have a really big back room and so we we're thinking about doing some indoor cornhole tournaments in the winter time to keep people coming in. Next slide, please. Through this whole process, we went into buying a business basically blind. And so we have looked at the different transition plans and what has to happen to keep this business growing and thriving and surviving in a rural community. So the transition plan that we have in mind, it's not going to be family. Um, I can't hold out until my four-year-old granddaughter is ready to take over this business. Um, she literally runs the store most of the time, but that's usually up one aisle and down the other. Um, do we wanna change the business model to maybe a cooperative, things like that? It's not really something that we've seen much success with in our rural area. Um, do we want to sell? My heart says I really don't want to sell, but my body says at some point you're going to have to. So one of the things that we have to be very vigilant in is finding the perfect fit. Somebody who has to understand our community, understand how important the history is to this store. I had a gentleman just a while ago walk in the door and he goes, I have a really old Coke cooler up front and he goes, is that the Coke cooler that used to sit back there? And I'm like, no, but those memories, you know, um, are a big part of this store. Um, all of that complicates the sale. It's hard to find somebody that's going to be that perfect fit, but the perfect fit is critical to the community. So they have to understand that, you know, you got rural farmers, what they're gonna be looking for, what the price point is, how to keep it down. So next slide, please. So our transition plan is a five to 10 year plan. Why are we starting so early? Well, one, we want it to be a successful transition. We want this store to be here for years to come. We want that four-year-old granddaughter to be able to come in the store and go, hey, I remember when. Um, the success of the store, the community acceptance. Our community has to be acceptant of whoever takes over to continue to make it grow. Um, someone has to understand the real culture. And like I said, it has to be a perfect fit and we have to realize there is no quick fix to it. So it takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of thinking and, you know, talking through and who, who would be a good fit and you know, looking at the future of it. What does it take? Um, next slide, please. We went through the mentoring program that um, the Rural Grocery Store offered last year. One of the things that I have started is a guidebook. 
So basically the guidebook is if somebody was going to come in and take over Mildred's store tomorrow, if I got sick and couldn't operate it, who's going to come in here and be able to run it? My husband doesn't even know the combination to the back safe. So that's not a bad thing, but you know, how, who do you order this from? Who do you order that from? And how do you get the price points to keep the prices down? So we've, I've been working on a guidebook that basically tells you step by step, this is what you order from here. This is what you do here. This is how you order online. Um, we're also working on creating a mentoring plan. So when the new orders take over, it's not, okay, here's the key, good luck. Um, we don't want somebody to be dropped in the way we took over and the success of the business is gonna be dependent on training the new owners to know the routines and know um, the step-by-step, -step, the daily operations. So um, we don't want history to repeat itself. So we wanna have a smooth transaction. We learned by the trial and error method and seven years we're still here. So we must not have had too many errors, but it hasn't been the easiest and we've learned a lot. So next slide, please. So the future goals of our store, we're always finding new ways to attract and grow and um, gain new customers. And we're getting them every day. There's always somebody in here. And, and the amazing thing to me is a lot of them come from our own home county and they're like, I didn't even know you existed. And I'm like, well, we're the best kept secret in Allen County, so spread the news. Um, five years from, from this point on to five years, we're still gonna be looking for that perfect fit for the transition. Hopefully in seven to nine years, we've located those people and we're mentoring them. In 10 years, we'd like to finalize the transition. And then as it goes on, we're not gonna leave them. We're gonna continue to support and utilize the store and its new owners and help support them in any way we can. Um, and as far as what Erica and Ryle had put together on the, um, the outline of what a rural grocery store owner looks like, we fit that perfectly because that's our age group, that's our transition time, the whole nine yards. So um, we fit right that average right in that average. Um, next slide, please. So what am I doing as far as our next steps? I continue to update the guidebook. Basically something new goes in there every week because we're always adding to finding new ways to attract more people to the store. So it's kind of like my little diary to keep track of things, you know, um, and continue to build and building our business and our revenue and decreasing the bottom line is all of that. And it's all included in the guidebook. Um, continue to build a following on social media. We use social media. I don't have time to do it myself. Um, my granddaughter used to come up and do it for me, one of the older ones. But now I have a, an employee who's great at that. And so she posts every day our daily specials. When we get something new in, she's perfect for that. Um, continue to mentor others that are interested in the grocery industry. You know, a lot of people look internally for their employees to transition to. Most of my employees have been um, retired women and um, others that are about the same age as me. So that's not really a good fit for that. So um, mentoring others, you know, we've had several people come to us that we're wanting to start grocery stores. And if any of you are out there, give it more than three to six months. It's a long-term process. It's not gonna happen overnight. So we'll be glad to help anybody that's interested in getting started and share our tips and, tra tips and tricks. Um, also, we plan to do a lot of continuing to take part in the Rural Grocery Store Initiative activities. And I encourage everybody that's looking at a grocery store to do that. Um, that's critical and there's a lot of resources there. Next slide, please. So if you need to contact me, here is our email and our phone and feel free to ask any questions and I'll try to help, help you get started with anything I can. All right, thank you so much, 
Regina, um, a lot of really good advice there. And hopefully people in the in attendance today got some good ideas from that presentation. So we have time now, 10 minutes or so for some questions. Um, so Regina and Carl, if you wouldn't mind just turning your videos back on. We have already received a couple of questions, but if you have any additional questions, feel free to continue posting them in the Q&A box. Um, but this first question that we received is from Mike, and he asks, any recommendations on how to market the sale of your store? How do you list it and with who? So I wondered if, Carl, maybe you could start and address that question, but then I also wanted to throw it over to Regina as well, because I know that some grocers worry about talking publicly about transitioning. So I'm just curious to hear how you think about that. But Carl, do you wanna go ahead and start um, with that question? Sure, thanks Erica. And nice job, Regina. Boy, you, you really nailed it for the, the grocery store owners. What a, what a great map to follow. I did answer that question privately. Um, but what, what I'd like to throw out there is that you just never know when you're going to have a buyer. So depending on the market that you're in, where you're located, there, there are business brokers out there. There's online sites like bizbuysell.com that can provide you an avenue or a conduit to different uh, buyers. It's, what I would really encourage is that if you live in a market and that you have an SBDC advisor that you can connect with, Talk to them about what they know of local resources. For example, Mike, I'm not sure what market he's in, but I'd be glad to help him work through some of the different scenarios. There's also strategic ways to try to sell your business um, that, that are available. Some people want to own more than one grocery store, and that might be an avenue to an exit. So there's lots of avenues to explore. You know, like Regina said, she doesn't have a successor. Her four-year-old granddaughter is probably not going to uh, want to want to take over that business. So finding an outside buyer in a rural market can be a challenge, and finding the right person is tantamount to a successful exit. So Regina, how do you feel about you know talking about transitioning publicly? Obviously, you're here today, but your transition as you've said, is probably more like 10 years down the road. So how do you, how do you view this? Um, we've talked about this a lot um, with, um, amongst ourselves, but, you know, in a really small community, it's really hard. If the news got out that the business wanted to be sold, um, it could be very detrimental to the business because then people are going to go, well, they're not going to be in business much longer, so we're not going to support them anymore. And we've seen that happen in our neighborhood. And so um, that's one of the biggest hurdles that we see as transitioning out. Um, we've been approached by some, um, I don't know, agents, I guess it is that you might say that um, brokers is what it is. And they will hook you up with the right buyer and this and that, and you don't have to accept that buyer and so you can be very picky and choosy, but um, there's a big hefty price tag associated with that also. Um, the other thing is, I think it's called bizsale.com. You can list online or something like that. So there's some avenues that way. It's just how open you feel like you can be in your community. And I think that's the key. You really, really have to know your community and who you're dealing with to know how to look for that buyer. Thank you, Regina. Um, we have time for just a couple more questions maybe, but Regina, um, kind of in the beginning of your presentation, you were discussing carrying on old traditions, starting new traditions, becoming a destination. And so I was wondering if you could talk about how you see those efforts being connected to business transition planning because to me, it seems like this is a way to build customer loyalty, right? And to continue to add value in your business before you transition. So is that kind of your strategy as well? Could you talk about that a little bit? Yes, I think, I think that um, becoming the community hub and however you have the ability to go about doing that 
um, is critical to the success of the business and to continue that. So one of the things we've discussed, our music night is a really big deal. So um, even though we consider selling at some point, you know, we will still be able to help the new owners do those types of things and continue those traditions. And again, it's all in the guidebook. Um, you know, knowing how to, knowing who to contact for the car show, knowing who to, you know, who the vendors are for the fall, fall festival, where do you get the pumpkins, all of this. And I try to list everything as it comes up and put it in that guidebook so that, you know, so that it's, it's seamless. So basically, if Lauren and I were to walk out today, the, the ideal hope is if we were to sell this business today and had our transition plan already gone through, say we're 10 years down the road, that the community and um, the people would not know anything different other than there's new people in the store. It may be a pipe dream, but that's it. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, I don't know if you've seen this in the chat, Regina, but there have been a lot of comments coming through about how the guidebook is such a good idea. Um, so I guess if people email you or get in touch with you, would you be willing to share a little bit about how you're doing this? Right, I would, yes. Okay, perfect, great. All right, um, well, I think that might be all the time we have now for questions. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you both so much, Carl and Regina, for being here. Um, this has been just a great way to kick off this webinar series. Um, maybe if you could both just provide your emails in the chat so people can get in touch with you if they, if they have further questions, that would be great. But thank you both so much. Right, and you. now um, we wanted to tell you about a couple events coming up and we wanted to give you a little preview of the next webinar. But before we do that, we wanted to share that we're very excited to be hosting the National Rural Grocery Summit this year. It'll be held June 20th and 21st in Wichita, Kansas. And this is just an incredible opportunity for independent grocers and other rural stakeholders to connect with each other and strategize about strengthening rural grocery operations and rural food systems. So we would love to see you at the summit. Um, if you're interested in presenting at the summit, our request for proposals is, is currently open as well. And the deadline to submit a proposal is February 1st. So you can find more information about that at ruralgrocery.org slash summit. Next slide. And then we also would love to hear your feedback on this webinar. Um, we have a very brief survey, which we'll post in the chat, um, where you can just tell us what you thought was most helpful. What would you like to see in upcoming webinars? What topics are you still curious about? Um, this survey is less than two minutes, but it's, it's really going to help us improve future programming. So we really appreciate any feedback that you have for us. And then finally, um, our next webinar is going to be on February 17th. And as Carl mentioned earlier, it's going to be on business valuation. Um, this is where a lot of people get stuck in their business transition. So you really don't want to miss this webinar. It's going to be um, really helpful and informative for you. So thank you all so much for joining us today. We hope you gained a lot of good information and good advice, good insights from Regina and Carl. Um, thank you, Regina and Carl. Thank you all for being here. And we hope to see you next month. Bye-bye.